Hello, Renegade Marketers. Welcome to Renegade Marketers Unite, the top-rated podcast for B2B CMOs and other marketing-obsessed individuals. Alrighty, folks, you're about to listen to a bonus huddle, a specially curated huddle that we run once a month with experts sharing their insights into the topics that are most important to our huddlers. The experts at this particular huddle were Forrester analyst Barbie Maddie and Nick Buck. They joined us to share the benchmarks that will help marketers defend their budgets and do their jobs better. Now, while we're on the subject of Forrester, I have an exciting announcement. CMO Huddles is now a community partner with Forrester's B2B Summit. Most people who've attended this summit recognize it as the best marketing conference of the year, and it's coming to Austin, Texas on June 5th to 7th. Huddlers will get access to preferred pricing and other exclusive benefits. Hit me up if you're a B2B CMO looking to connect with fellow CMOs and Forrester's top-notch analysts in a very special way. All right, let's get to the episode. Hello and welcome to a very special bonus huddle. Today, we'll, we will be speaking not with just one Forrester analyst, but two Forrester research analysts, Barbie Maddie and Nick Buck. And we're going to be talking about benchmarks and best practices, all in the interest of helping you defend your budgets and or allocate what you have more effectively. We both have a covetous depth of knowledge about marketing and marketing effectiveness. Now, since the initial impetus for this show were huddler requests for budget benchmarks, we're going to start with a rapid fire review with Barbie. So hello, Barbie. Hello. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So in our prep call, you mentioned that Forrester's research on the performance of high growth companies versus flat to declining ones helped reveal some startling disparities. If we just look at high growth companies with a thousand or more employees for a moment, Mm -hmm. what is their marketing to revenue ratio? Just for a little bit of clarification, I did want to put a number around high growth. And when we say high growth, we look at companies with a thousand employees that are over 20% annual revenue growth. And the majority, 51% to be exact, invested 6.1 to 9% marketing as a percentage of revenue. Okay. So six to 9%. And so Mm -hmm. the presumption then is low growth companies are spending a lot less. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it's it goes back to that crazy spend money to make money paradox. And it is a paradox indeed. <laughs> so were they spending 3%? What are low growth companies? What was what was their average? It was something like 3%, I think. Well, so if you if you want to do an apples to apples, that's 6.1 to 9%, 33% of the low of the flat to declining companies invested 6.1 to 9%. But if you want to get really down into the weeds, a third, almost a third, 32% invested 4% or less. So these thousand companies flat to declining invested 4% or less, a third of them did. Now, this occurred to me, and and, and I'm sorry we didn't prepare for this, but there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing here. There's a company that thinks it's going to grow pretty well, so they're going to invest more. And then there's a company that's thinking, we're not going to do so well, so we're going to invest less. It, can we draw the line that says the spending drives growth here or there's there's a, a correlation but not necessarily a causation? Definitely correlation. I wouldn't go so far as to commit to causation. Um, I'd love to. <laughs> that would be fantastic, right? Um, but the approach that we took is you have to spend money to drive growth, but let's be really smart and analytical and use insights to drive exactly where we spend. And that's kind of the premise behind our planning guide is we followed the spend patterns for these high growth companies, and we know what they did to drive growth over the past two years. So why reinvent the wheel? Why don't you try and kind of take these three big concepts that we're asking them to do and put your own company spin on it, but still be very hyper-focused? Okay. So we talked about high growth companies at enterprise level, a thousand or more employees. What was it for high growth, smaller companies in terms of marketing as a percent of revenue? Yeah. So I, I confused those numbers earlier. So 43% of 
less than 1,000 employee companies invested that 6.1 to 9%. So okay. 43% for less than 1,000, 51% for more than 1,000, both growing annual revenue over 20%. The absolute minimum that under 1,000 companies that are high growth invested was 3.1. And conversely, if you look at under 1,000 employees that were flat to declining, a third of them, 30% rounding up, invested 3% or less in marketing. So again, it's just you, the spend money to make money, but you have to be smart about where you spend it. Right. So we've got this range now, 6 to 9% for growth companies, and it almost doesn't matter whether they're large or small, they're investing in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and a different source just to sort of help folks put it in their, in their mind, the CMO survey by Duke's Fuqua with School of Business has the average marketing to revenue ratio at 8.79%, which is really a very precise number. And, yeah. and, and it, by the way, I looked at that, the, that data, they survey a lot of companies and 66% of the companies that are in this uh, survey are B2B. So, mm -hmm. you know, you would think that maybe consumer brands would spend more. And mm -hmm. does that, I mean, so if, if folks are looking for a number. Does that number look like that's a rational number for folks to sort of benchmark against? Well, my sister-in-law, Kalam Maddie, actually is a double duke. So that's a fun fact. <laughs> um, and uh, she's actually in marketing, but on the B2C side. Um, but so to directly answer your question, that 6.1 to 9% is the range. Our average from our B2B marketing survey data is 7%. I can get to the point, whatever, if you need me to, but, you know, between six and nine, Duke is saying 8.79, we're saying seven. I feel comfortable within that range. Well, and, and that's good to know because your numbers are, are primarily B2B. I mean, I would say they're only B2B, 100% B2B. And so that may be the difference there yeah. in, in that third. Okay. So we've got that yeah. benchmark. You guys say 7%. So anywhere from seven to 9% is... Mm -hmm kind of a sweet spot. And if you're below that, chances are you're under investing in marketing. And if you're above that, you are an aggressive spender. Okay. So let's yep. go through a few more data points because we're really moving along. Do you have data on marketing budget allocation between programs and people? And this is a debate that we, not a debate, a conversation that we've had a lot of huddles and then it's sort of, it's 50-50, some heavily 60-40, some are 40-60. Yeah. Where are you all in that allocation? Well, you challenged me with this question because this had to go to a different data source. So I've been talking about data from our B2B marketing survey. So the numbers I'm going to give you now are from our Forrester benchmark data, which is benchmark data for our clients that we've collected over the years. From a high growth perspective, and I am cheating. I'm looking at my, my cheat sheet <laughs> because there are a lot of numbers to remember. Yep. Um, so high growth companies allocate 49% to programs and 40% to personnel. And then on the flat to declining side, they allocate 39% to programs and 52% to personnel. So if you're thinking about it from a, a disparities, it's high growth companies allocate 10 percentage points more on programs. And then the flat to declining companies allocate 12 percentage points more on people. So there's there's that imbalance between the programs and the people. And if you look at the data more closely, you can see with, you know, with the high growth, 49 percent, 40, that's a nine percentage point spread. If you look at flat to declining, that's 39 to 52. There, the, there's more peaks and valleys on the flat to declining and more consistency on the high growth. Well, and it first, it makes sense to me that if you're spending more on programs, in theory, programs are what drive growth, right? Yes. And, and programs are media programs, are content programs, are stuff that actually would qualify as marketing. There's something yeah. missing in here. 49 and 40 is 89%. Is that 11% technology? Because I don't think 49 and 40 add up to 100, right? Well, I'm saving that for later because okay, we fine. have a specific question around technology, but that remaining bucket is... The, the remainder to get to 100% is split between technology and outsourcing. Okay, tech and outsourcing. Okay, mm -hmm. great. 
I think that's a really important and fascinating number. And I want to fixate on that 49% mm -hmm. high growth companies going into programs, 40% into people. If your balance mm -hmm. is off of that, um, it's an interesting thing to look at. Okay. I know you all believe this is the wrong question, but do you have guidance on the average <laughs> percent of marketing budget allocated technology? Yeah. So the direct answer, because I know you wanted the numbers, um, high growth allocate 4.6% and flat to declining allocate 4.9. But the question isn't how much should you, should I budget for tech or what net tech should I buy next? There's a very prescriptive process that we encourage clients and prospects to go, go through. It's There's three questions. You have to say, how do I plan to grow? There's six options for growth. Do we have the six essential technologies in place as our technology foundation and are, are all of the integration points connected? And then the third question is, are we taking an outcome-focused approach to selecting the tech that's based on business goals? So that eliminates the situation where you, you say, oh, I have to do this initiative. I have to buy the tech to support the initiative. That perpetuates tech sprawl. And so taking this three-step process and being mindful about how your existing tech stack integrates is is more prescriptive more prescriptive advice that we would give rather than just the budget number right it's it's not about the technology it's how you're going to use the technology i understand exactly. that but i think it's so helpful to have a number like 4.6% as a simply to look at it because if you look at your budget yeah. now and you're spending a third of it on technology you might be overweighted right yeah. Um, yeah. And because all of that money that's being spent on technology, very little of it actually would be called marketing. All of it would yeah. become data analytics. But I thought that number um, is remarkably low. And I'm just curious, if, for the CMOs who, who are listening, please feel free to share um, whether you're above or below that um, number uh, in chat. Because I, I just, I suspect in our conversations that probably the average is closer to 10%. Um, and some may be even a lot higher than that. Yeah. But there are two things that just came out of this thing. One, one is spending more on programs means you're doing more marketing, managing your technology budget so that it is serving you and the mm -hmm. outcomes that you're looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at total marketing costs versus sales costs? And is there a point at which marketing or sales is overweighted? Yes, this was another challenge. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so uh, this is the benchmark data again, instead of the CMO survey, because the CMO survey was pure B2B, pure marketing. From our benchmark data, the investment of sales as a percentage of revenue for high growth companies 46.1% invest 10.1 to 15%. But the average is a little bit higher than that range at 15.8%. And then on the flip side, flat to declining companies, only 31% invest in that 10.1 to 15%. And the average is below that spread at 13.4%. So 13 to almost 16% is the range for sales as a percentage of revenue for high growth and low growth companies over a thousand employees. Sales as a percent of revenue. Amazing. Thank you for that. We're now going to move over to Nick Buck to discuss the implications of these benchmarks. So Nick, let's discuss the implications of these things. First, hello. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Drew. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so when we talked last week, you mentioned that all B2B marketers really need to address changing buyer behaviors. Can you give a quick overview of these changes? And then we can go through what marketers can do about these things sort of one at a time. For sure. And just to establish the, the background for that, obviously, a lot of the conversation with Barbie in the last few minutes has been about the fact that these high growth organizations run a more efficient operation than the lower growing organizations. And I think one of the key reasons that that is so important is that clearly there's a lot of work to be done. I'm probably stating the obvious by saying that the work of a B2B marketing leader and the B2B marketing organization is certainly not getting any easier. And based on that, that fact that you mentioned that the, the buyers are becoming harder to track down and harder to engage. We find that they're certainly not buying alone. I know it's well known that, you know, these days buyers are buying as part of a buying group. They have more company as they navigate themselves through that buying process. And as they do that, the people they engage in that discussion is getting ever wider. Our research shows that at least 60% of B2B buying decisions these days involve a buying group which consists of at least four different stakeholders, 
And as we know, that, that buying journey is also getting more complicated. And that's kind of my second point here is that as we're thinking about how those different members of the buying group navigate their way through that buying decision-making process, they certainly have more information available to them. They can find it through a whole range of different channels. And obviously that's making it a lot more complicated as marketers to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the right place at the right time to help them make the right decisions as they go through that process. It's, it's a very well-known statistic. I see it all over the place these days, but we see that a typical B2B sale these days consists of at least 27 touches from beginning to end. And that's fairly evenly split between marketing and sales touches. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there to actually make sure that across both the marketing stakeholders and the sales stakeholders, we are in the right place at the right time and delivering the right information to the right people in the right way. And I think I say it just makes it a very complicated, as you mentioned to me the other day, it increases the amount of work that needs to get done. And especially in times of uncertainty like we are now, it becomes a real conundrum for, for marketing leaders to decide what to do and what not to do. I'm just I'm sort of absorbing the 27 number. We've heard it a lot in huddles as, as well, uh, anywhere from 22 to 27. I want to make sure that that number is after somebody has put you on the list. This is after. This sure. is not the, the discovery to get you on the list, which may be X number of touches that you weren't involved in. Let's talk a little bit about the implications, not just the problems, but some of the yeah. solutions that you all are prescribing. So we have multiple stakeholders in the buying process. So what is it that marketers need to be doing in terms of you know how they're spending their money, how they're talking about their business, one of the things that I see often that to me is problematic is different personas, almost different campaigns that express the business in a completely different way to each of the audiences. Talk about, again, dealing with these different stakeholders. Well, a word we're using a lot these days, Drew, is the word orchestration. And we think about the fact that as you're looking to solve for that ever more increasingly complicated puzzle here, what we need to think about is that it's not just a case, it's not a problem for the demand team. It's not a problem for the brand team. It's a problem for the entire organization or an opportunity for the entire organization. But what we need to therefore do is put ourselves in a position to have a truly aligned, orchestrated approach and really understand in the context of all the things that we can be doing, what are the most important things? And that goes right back to the beginning in the planning stage of having a very clear and aligned view, not just within marketing, but also across the entire organization about, again, where's that growth going to come from? Is it going to come from net new acquisition? Is it going to come from retention? Is it going to come from cross-sell, upsell? And really making sure that as we do that, we understand across all parts of the organization what that means in terms of who we should be talking to, what we should be saying, what that conversation looks like, and crucially making sure as we do that, that we're not taking a one-size-fits-all approach as well. Again, if we're saying that it's a more complex, more diverse buying group, the different members of those buying group, the reason we have that group is that they care about different things. They're asking about different questions and they're looking for different information. So again, it's a, it's a real challenge for marketers because we need to make sure, therefore, that we're actually double clicking into each of those and making sure that we're not just saying the same thing to everyone, but we are taking the opportunity through our plan and our build and our execution activities to really get as specific as we can and make sure as we're doing that, yeah, I say we are interacting with folks in the right way, bringing all of them along in that discussion in sync and crucially being able to detect and understand if we're leaving anyone behind and making sure we can address that as we go forward as well. So addressing the complication in all of this, I mean, we've talked about orchestration. One of the things that those 27 touches you may or may not be in control of, right? Yeah. In the sense that a lot of buyers <laughs> these days want to direct the journey themselves, right? Yeah. They don't necessarily even want to talk to a salesperson unless that person can really be helpful. So what is it that we're going to do as marketers that are going to, that you're seeing that will help uncomplicate this? Yeah, no, no, you're asking a great question. And one of the key things we talk about here is that, as you say, there are different types of interactions that we need to be enabling and we need to put ourselves in the position to visualize what those look like and actually, therefore, as you say, serve up the right information through the right channels, even through those channels, perhaps that, you know, to which we don't have direct control. And we think in terms of, yeah, of those 27 interactions, some we are going to have complete control of. They're going to be through our own properties. They're going to be through our own people imparting information. But also there are obviously going to be third party sites. There's going to be those other conversations going on. And one thing we're thinking about a lot, especially in our portfolio marketing practice, is the fact that there's an opportunity here as well. 
Again, it requires more work, but it's an opportunity, which is the fact that most organizations have some level of buyer insights. They have persona profiles. They've done a lot of work. They may have spent a lot of money to actually devise those. But at the end of the day, we find those being highly underutilized. Quite often, they're used for some high-level messaging. They're used for the creation of content. What they're not used for is by enough parts of the organization, and they're not used deep enough down into the build and execution and optimization part of the value chain as well. So one thing we're trying to help organizations do is realize that you have those profiles, you understand, you have all this richness that you understand about your buyers. Let's make sure we're truly building those personas into every step of our, our process, making sure that whether it's the marketers in the field, the marketers interacting with our buyers, if it's the salespeople, that we're truly building the leveraging of those insights into both the, the proceeds, but even into the technologies that, are, that we're using to try and make sure that we're really actually not just coming up with a nice idea about what this interaction might look like, but really making it happen in real life too. And it, it requires a lot of work to make that part of our day-to-day -day work. So. Well, and, and I, so as I'm imagining this scenario where every single person, and I've seen cases where, you know, there are 20 different personas and now you yeah. have, and you're saying that each department and each individual needs to understand each of those 20 personas and they have to create almost customized magic it becomes this infinite matrix. And I also anticipate a, at a problem that we talked about in other situations, which is you present the brand to the CFO and the financial people as this is the cost saving brand. And you say, uh, for the line of business person, you say, this is the market leadership brand. And suddenly they come together and they're looking at a different beast. And so I'm yep. also wondering when you're talking about using these personas in specific, how does a brand stay fit, uh, consistent, even as we're talking about these micro messaging almost? Uh, and that, that's the, one of the, the tricky things through indeed. And you say whether it's 20 personas or however many it might be. Uh, and, you know, part of our conversation today is how we actually, again, build in that efficiency to make sure we can do the most important things that we want to do. And I think a lot of this does come down to real focus as well about saying, you know, in the context, if we're facing budget cuts, if we're facing challenging times right now, you know, what are going to be those real moments of truth? What are going to be the most important areas to focus on? One thing that you and I discussed last week was the fact that actually this can't just be a pre-purchase exercise either. Again, we, we really don't see personas being used enough along the entire length of the customer life cycle as well. And, and our research shows that 77% of B2B revenue tends to come from our existing customers from our install base, whereas a much smaller proportion of that, about 42% of organizations are really actively deploying marketing resource to the post-purchase customer lifecycle. And I think we have to, again, it comes back to that question of alignment and orchestration. We need to understand in terms of where the revenue or where the growth is going to come from, both today and in the future, understanding what marketing's role is, but really pushing for the fact that marketing has such a key role to play and actually therefore not only defining those pre-purchase personas, but think about what that might look like, about who we're talking to deeper down into the customer life cycle and how we then use that, whether it be brand or demand to bring it back to the, the next growth conversation we might be having. So, you know, the pundits are talking recession. We're starting to see it if for real in other countries, uh, less so in the US quite yet. And we're already seeing some softening in terms of, among huddlers at least, in terms of deals are just taking longer to close. Sure. So the emphasis, quite likely in 2023, is going to be on existing customers, right, and, and retaining. So I'm curious if we go back to this idea of we're not using persona data we already know when we're marketing to existing customers. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and, and what that looks like? Yeah, because one, one, one of the risks here, isn't it, is the fact that actually as we're looking to do more work, we're looking to talk to more people, we're looking to persuade more people that that content engine can spin out of control, which is actually probably the opposite to the reality that most people are facing today. So I think some of that does come down to the fact that, yeah, enhanced focus is a term I've been using rather a lot here as well, is the fact that, you know, when you think about absolutely... Uh, most B2B organizations we talk to tell us they have a ton of content already. Some of that's been obviously underutilized. It's one of the most common complaints we hear in our discussions with CMOs and marketing leadership teams. But really trying to understand, therefore, as we go forward and we think about, again, maybe we're facing either budget constraints or a budget reduction on the marketing side. How can we really position marketing to be maximizing its impact? It comes back again a little bit to what Barbie was saying about efficiency and making sure that we are placing our bets in the right places to make sure that you know, in line with where the business thinks it's going next year, making sure that we have a clear and transparent plan about what we're going to be doing and what we're not going to be doing. And I, I think, again, 
one thing we are, again, we see it in our data, we see organizations doing it already, but we are actively encouraging organizations to, especially in this, what is planning season for a lot of companies now, definitively shifting some of that budget, which may have been focused on pre-purchase demand generation into more of a, an account-based approach or a, a retention and cross-sell and upsell motion. And it's a very different type of marketing and it requires perhaps some new approaches, some new competencies within the organization. It absolutely requires a different type of governance to make sure that we're establishing those guide rails and making sure, therefore, we're not just doing things which seem easy and look like we're busy on any given day, but it's really actually helping the marketing organization stay aligned to what's going to be most important to the, the business in the near term. Okay. So we are focusing, we're really thinking about it and I'm ready for Kay Moffat. Uh, Kay, with your question. My question was back to uh, what Barbie was talking about. In the budget breakdown, mm -hmm. I was trying to understand a little bit more nuanced of programs versus people. So for instance, okay. we have we have really moved towards in-house agency. We have almost, almost no agency costs. Okay. That means yeah. our people cost is high. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand if like agencies, vendors would count as programs or where agencies would fall. Well, you had this 11% uh, that was unallocated, which was technology mm -hmm. and outsourcing, right? Oh, so okay. Okay. So then that the, was the 11%. Right. Okay. So in technology yeah. and ideally it was that three and a half. So that leaves seven to 8% for outsourcing roughly, if my math is right. Is that right, Barbie? Yeah. Yeah. It was between 10 and 13 somewhere. So yeah, you're correct. And then just kind of for the way that we track our budget hierarchy, we look at the top number is marketing as a percentage of revenue. And then we look at people programs, outsourcing and technology. Spoiler alert for 2023 and 2024 planning guides, we're going to trim the outsourcing piece and just focus on those big three buckets. But then within the program bu bucket, we account for the different programs we're going to do, reputation, demand, enablement, engagement, and operations. But there's also headcount budget in the program budget. So we're, it's kind of like a distributed approach to headcount. Obviously, we can't account for how everybody budgets in their own company, but that's kind of the 80-20 rule for how we got to our budget hierarchy. Thanks for that. So mm -hmm. Barbie, you went quickly through this and I want to slow it down a little bit. The five <laughs> areas that you see marketing <laughs> spending their dollars on, reputation, demand, enablement. I typed enablement twice. Engagement. That's awesome. Engagement. Thank you. Yeah. And operations. Correct. So yeah. now I know, and this is from, you know, two years worth of conversations and huddles that demand has a tendency to get a lot of those dollars, mm -hmm. but talk about from your standpoint, what is an ideal if there is allocation between these things? And, and, and Nick, maybe you can address it from a forward-looking standpoint, but if we look currently, Barbie, across those five buckets, I'm going to say them again, reputation, demand, enablement, engagement, and operations, what's best practices? Well, we're definitely seeing a shift in the balance of that distribution from a high growth perspective. So, when you're when you're looking across all five of those categories and where they're allocating spend it's a lot more evenly distributed on the high growth side regardless though you know demand should not cannibalize the budget for reputation engagement and enablement because it all needs to work together to be integrated to get back to Nick's point about you've got 27 interactions to account for. That's industry average. You might work for an industry or you know, sell to a particular customer who requires 35 interactions, or you might need 15. So the point is, if, if we're being super prescriptive about it, it's really what we're telling people is to connect brand to demand. That reputation and demand budget needs to be a lot more evenly distributed. And because a lot of the focus for next year is going to be on post-sale customer engagement, we need to see that sales enablement and engagement numbers go up. So again, it's about balancing and not having a large spike in your demand budget and not a lot to do to drive reputation, enable your sellers or engage your customers. And then operations is keeping the lights on. <laughs> Nick, go ahead and weigh in on uh, that. I was going to say, I, I, I agree with Barbie. I think she's absolutely right. I think it's about balance. I think it's also about context as well. And forgive me if this is somewhat of a, a consulting answer, but it is, it is going to depend. It's going to look different for every organization. And it's actually going to look different for every campaign that you're running as well. Because 
for every conversation that you're looking to drive in the market. The amount of education and awareness you're going to have to do is going to vary. The amount of explanation around your solutions and products is going to change. The amount of competitive positioning that you have, it's going to vary. But one crucial thing here is I think that what we would strongly, strongly uh, recommend all organizations do is make sure that you do have each of those different program families represented and in in a deliberate balance as well. My wife's a baker. She's baking cakes every day. And if you leave one ingredient out, your cakes are turn out, it's going to turn out funny looking or it's not going to rise as high as you want it to. It's all about making sure you have the right proportion and balance between the different ingredients based on, on what you are trying to achieve, really. Which is probably a bad example, but I, I think it's you know, we, we see a lot of organizations, again, especially in difficult times, taking one ingredient out and expecting the results to come out in a good way. So. It went from uh, cake to matzah. Yeah, just like- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so you have an audience that is going to inherently agree with you in the sense that, yeah, we were marketers, we believe in reputation and demand and that those two things going. Yet n- a number of the CMOs in this are, are VC and PE funded, and they are being measured by net new logos in a large Stand. And if you're being measured by net new logos, there's no bonus points for improving reputation. There's only bone or enablement or engagement. The reward is based on net new logos. And so I'm just wondering how your research shows that reputation and demand equals more growth. Because they need this. This is, this, is, yeah. this is the part that if this business yeah. case existed, they wouldn't have to do things like pretend that this brand spending or this where isn't really that, like creating the budget that just says demand gen. And we get this question all the time. And I next week, I'll be um, putting out a new blog about the top five questions I'm getting about the planning guide. And one of those questions is, how do I explain ROI on brand investment to the board, CEO, or investors? And so if you, if you think about it, when you connect brand and demand, you are helping build that positive reputation over time. And then that positive reputation increases the organic flow into the top of your funnel. And then that supports and enhances your waterfall volume and speed. Uh, It increases the likelihood that customers are going to adopt and renew and then advocate. And then ultimately advocate drives engagement and purchase intent. So, you know, understanding that people are having a lot of new goals, new logo goals. I talked to one client where they have a 70% revenue goal on net new logos. And I'm trying to help her make everybody realize that's impossible. (laughs) 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 <laughs> yeah, tell that to the CEO and the board and and everybody else. And I I have to say that that sounds like a perfect world. And I also think you have a longer term horizon than most CMOs are actually given or negotiate. Looking ahead in a recession, reputation for many CMOs feels like a luxury. It's a longer term investment, not a, a yeah. something that will accrue in the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter, year and a half from now. Um, so how do in those circumstances, they defend any part of the budget, whether they call it reputation or not, are the kinds of things that do build reputation? Well, well I think you raised two interesting points here, Drew, which is actually one of them comes down to our the definition of and the understanding of demand. Because again, I understand fully that coming back to my point about context, if you're in a high growth business that's VC supported, absolutely, there's going to be a a lot of focus on certain business objectives about acquiring new customers and new revenue. And yes, absolutely, that's about generating new business, but it's not generally just about demand generation programs as we think of it from a marketing perspective. I think absolutely, as we think about in order to achieve that, generate that demand, to create that pipeline, to close those deals, as Barbie mentioned, it's going to require a combination, therefore, of those different ingredients in the mix, the reputation, making sure we're enabling our sellers to be part of that end-to-end conversation so we're not having a marketing conversation, then a sales conversation. All these parts are actually part of the our overall approach to generating demand. And I think sometimes we get a little bit sort of blinkered when we think about the definition of demand. And I think the second part of that is really then we need to be doing a better job as marketers about educating the business about really what it is, you know, what we can be doing, the value we can be adding. And therefore, hopefully through that education process, giving ourselves a little bit more permission to lay out our plan about how we're going to go about generating that demand and pointing out that, you know, that we're not just going to focus on 
digital tactics, or we're not going to take one of those ingredients off the table because at the end of the day, it's going to be detrimental to all of us. My second bad analogy, maybe, as I was thinking about this as we've just <laughs> gone into November here, is that if we're heading to Thanksgiving in a few weeks' time and we're looking to save a little bit of money there, we're not just going to serve turkey. We can take the pumpkin pie away. That's fine by me. I'm not a pumpkin pie kind of guy. But we again, we, there are other ways to save money. We don't necessarily just have to take one ingredient completely off the table and expect everyone to be happy and not go raiding the cupboards afterwards for something that's going to satisfy them. So. Well, there um, is a turkey, a turkey shortage these days, so. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so um, we've got bread and we've got turkey um, and no pumpkin pie for Nick, just to uh, make a note of that. So a question uh, in, in the chat stream said, brand reputation is also said to reduce price sensitivity, enabling premium pricing. Does this align with your re research, one, and two, does it resonate with the C-suite, which is probably more important. I haven't personally heard the premium pricing piece, but what I what we have heard is about, and it's one of our big three takeaways for planning for 2023, is about making it a purpose-driven brand because you, you have to stand for something these days. You're held more accountable. People are, have higher expectations. And so when you invest in brand reputation, not only do you attract customers that align with your values, but you attract and retain high quality employees as well. Okay. So thinking about this and the biggest picture, which is the, the million dollar question is, what should marketing ROI be? How about 5X? <laughs> How about I answer your question with a question? <laughs> And I'm going to say, well, it depends on what, what does return mean to your organization? That's the loaded word is return. And I did uh, talk to my colleague, Ross Graber yesterday, and uh, he did mention that he was on one of these shows with you. And so my answer is the same answer that Ross gave. <laughs> <laughs> Which you can Just refresh us. Is a refresher is, is it's really around the topic of how do you create revenue lift and cost optimize that lift is the answer to your ROI. Yeah, I was going back and, and looking at some of the things that Ross talked about as well and just reminded me that one of the things that Ross was talking about was also trying to figure out how your product or service actually adds value to the companies that you're selling to, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just sort of looking at, and, and, and marketing plays a role with that. Okay, 5X is not the answer, but it is an answer that I see a lot of <laughs> online. I won't confirm uh, or deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. All right. Now we completed, we had five huddles in October, all of which focused on budgeting. Roughly half of the CMOs uh, in CMO huddles are under pressure to cut their budgets in 2023 in anticipation of a much tougher um, sales environment. So recognizing that you don't want to cut, but where are you recommending that folks look at to cut? Yeah, that's a really tough question because of course I'm not going to say you can't cut anything and I'm not going to go say, hey, you have to go cut X and X. <laughs> I'm not even going to put a word to that because I don't want it to be taken out of context. But it, first step is to look for efficiencies. And I know that's a super vague answer. So there are opportunities to look for efficiencies. For example, a lot of enterprise companies uh, have a dedicated customer experience. Well, you've invested resources into that. Why can't you apply that to your employee experience and get some money out of it? Corporate tax, nobody likes to play corporate tax, but you know, purpose-driven brand, focusing on post-sale customer engagement and addressing changing buying behaviors, which are the three big marketing initiatives that we're pushing. That is a distributed allowance. Like that's involves customer marketing, customer engagement. It avoids, avoids corporate marketing, communications, sales. The onus shouldn't fall solely to marketing and there should be a reconciliation effort to see what can be leveraged and be more efficient with the dollars. Um, I'm curious because going back to what 
Nick said about, we're going to need to focus a little bit more than we did maybe in 2022. Maybe we have to cast a slightly narrower net. And I think that net not only just applies to the personas, for example, maybe you go after fewer verticals, maybe. And, and again, I think in the, in the interest of, of looking to doing less better, I'm wondering, uh, Nick, you're shaking your head positively, not it. What does focus look like in 2023? I mean, if we go through it, I know a lot of the CMOs are saying we're not going to do all the events that we did, or we're going to go rogue. We're going to do less content, but we're going to do bigger, better stuff. I mean, are there areas where you all are seeing really uptake in focus? Yeah. Again, I see some familiar names on the the participants here, and they probably know me out. A slightly optimistic guy. And I think that actually, I come back to that, as you say, it's about enhanced focus. And I was talking to a CMO recently, actually, who is expecting a budget cut going into 2023. And he described it as a healthy forcing function. Now, admittedly, their organization's in great shape. They're, they're doing great things. But he said, as I think about that, going back to Barbie's topic about, you know, identifying areas to mitigate waste, but also again, yeah, Let's, let's be honest, if we get a budget cut, we're probably going to be able to do less stuff next year. So really, it does put us marketing in a powerful position to really drive that conversation and say, yes, OK, of all those things we're going to do, let's be really clear again and aligned and orchestrated in our approach about what are those most important things. And again, we still don't necessarily always see the right level of quantification of those business objectives and marketing's role in that. So I think there's a big opportunity here to really go back to the drawing board and say, okay, if you're cutting my budget by 10%, 15%, let's just have a look at in the context of what we as a business are trying to achieve in terms of acquiring new customers and growing and retaining our existing customers. Let's be very clear about what the most important things you expect my marketing organization to do. But then crucially go on to the second point and say, in the, in the interest of waste and uh, sort of making the best of what we have, let's be very clear then about, about what we need to be doing to achieve those goals. Maybe we were planning five campaigns and we are going to do four campaigns now because as you say, we don't have as much resource. We don't want to take one ingredient arbitrarily off the table. We want to make sure that we're still driving that balanced end-to-end conversation. We're still doing our enablement of our sellers. We're still engaging our existing customers. We're still doing the brand and demand piece. Maybe we're doing slightly less of each, but we're identifying and based on that understanding of those personas we have, we are deliberately trimming certain areas and making sure what we do serve up is what's going to be most engaging, most relevant to those new audiences, but also making sure that we're keeping that in the right balance that that Barbie had mentioned. On the news this morning, I was watching the the SpaceX launch of the the reusable rockets. I I kind of thought of content like (laughs) reusable rockets. We're always building new stuff, but I think we're in a situation now, especially in tougher times. Let's think about how we've got all that great content, all that great messaging available to us. Let's think about how we can deploy it in the right way to to focus recycle. on the right, the right objectives. So. Find the good stuff and, and recycle. So I want to go back to that, that you said that I they're being told, cut your budget 10 to 20% or freeze your budget, yep. but their goals aren't going down. They're not. So yeah, we can trim a little bit, but if if we're if you get a serious cut, let's just say a 20% cut, and that you're still being asked to uh, deliver a 20% growth goal or 20% growth on pipeline, What's the argument? I mean, in and God forbid the CMO actually does that because then they were sandbagging all the time. But how do we sort of get some alignment, give some ammunition to the CMOs to say, you can't do that and have that expectation that we're going to cut the budget well, and see growth? Yeah, well, one, one thing I would say here is I think that transparency is our friend here. And I know a lot of organizations already do this, but yeah. especially as we enter sort of November, December timeframe, we talk more and more about the marketing plan on a page and the, basically using our marketing planning process and our visualization of that as our friend in this scenario where we're saying, okay, we understand again, and we think of our plan on a page at a very high level. And I know some of you probably use it already, really having a crisp encapsulation of what the business goals are, what that means in terms of what marketing is going to focus on, what our priorities are going to be down into how we're going to measure ourselves, what we're looking to achieve, the key actions we're going to take. But crucially, at the end of that is the risks and dependencies saying, you know, so we've got this end to end storyboard almost of saying, okay, so we know what you're trying to achieve. This is the role we're going to play. This is how we're going to help you as a marketing organization. These are the things we are going to do. And crucially, the things we're not going to do. And then right down the end of the story saying, oh, by the way, let's just be very clear here that as we do this, we don't have quite as much budget or resources as we did last year. So we want to be quite clear up front here that 
These are the things we're going to focus on. We're going to push back on some of those other things that are not included in this plan at this stage. We're going to work with you to revise it over time, but we want to be as clear as we can right now to set those expectations. Yeah. The only thing that I would add is I, in case you can't tell, I am a total data nerd. So I actually, there's a, a tool that Forrester has called the revenue engine planning tool. And I just pull up that tool. It's literally like this dollar goes in. This is how many, whatever, it customizes to whatever waterfall you're using. So let's just say the simplest waterfall. Here's with the, the budget and your conversion rates and your velocity. It inc incorporates the sales numbers too. It takes sales and marketing, combines it into one. And it says with this much budget, here's the output. And this much budget, here's out. So it's a scenario planning tool that I equip the CMOs with to say, if my budget cut is this, these are the results you can expect. So I'm going to wrap things up and then I'm going to ask you both for a quick to do's and a don't for the CMOs. But in my mind, the real, the thing that I heard is focus is your friend. <laughs> you can't take the turkey off the table. You need to cut sort of from all the, the areas of the five that they talked about, look very carefully at your programs versus your people budget. Really look at that because if you're overspending on people, you are not spending as much on marketing and marketing is what you're there to do in order to drive the reputation and build the brand and do the enablement and all those other things. Okay, that was my summary. Um, Barbie, let's start with you. Two do's and a don't for the CMOs <laughs> as to get the most out of their budget in 2023. First do I recommend is CMOs, your marketing ops leader is a four leaf clover. And I so strongly believe that, that I wrote a blog with that title, in fact. <laughs> you cannot get through this without having somebody with data and insights on your side and by your side. So that's my one do. Second do is really just focus. And when we say focus, I mean, it's three things that we've advised CMOs to focus on. Addressing changing buyer behaviors, which is an integrated campaign approach, which an integrated campaign is how you distribute your budget. Shocker, we intentionally aligned those. And then don't fall victim to short-termism. All right. And Nick, bring us home. Okay. Two do's and a don't. Okay. My first do uh, is I think absolutely make existing customers a material and elevated part of your plan for 2023. I know it can be a it can be a big ask. You have to persuade people that this is something that marketing should be doing, but absolutely focus on the fact that your existing customers are going to be your path to growth in many instances. And to the extent you can, and we can help with this, try and quantify the degree to which that is going to be an impact on your business. And I'm going to cheat with the second, uh, second one, which is to say, I absolutely would implore everyone to develop that marketing plan on a page. When we first developed it, we thought this is too simple. It's almost too obvious, but actually just the exercise of going through it is so powerful and it becomes such a powerful communication vehicle that it actually allows marketing to take a more proactive stance in those discussions about what's going to be important for the coming period. And in terms of the don'ts, just think carefully about what you are putting on the table. As you, as you said yourself, Drew, you know, don't necessarily take the turkey off, but understand what people really like and what's going to be left over afterwards and really just focus on the important things to make sure the, the mix tastes good. Thank you both, Nick, uh, Buck, and Barbie, Maddie from Forrester Research. Uh, amazing uh, content in a, in a very concentrated period of time. I can't wait to see your plan on the page. Uh, I know that uh, this is something that we've used over the years, incredibly effective in terms of making marketing easy to understand within the organization and everybody gets to see the priorities. In terms of cultivating customer champions, it's like that's chapter eight of, of my book. I highly <laughs> encourage you to revisit that because there are about 15 ideas ideas in there and how to do it. Okay. Thank you all. I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.